The night, baby, he's in Judah asleep. I wonder who will wake him, bring him to his feet. Speak now, or forever hold your peace. The There's a night, baby, he's in Judah asleep. I wonder who will wake him, bring him to his feet. Speak now, or forever hold your peace. coming today uh, to our uh, presentation of uh, uh, the legacy of the life of Dr. Willie Housel. It's part of our Black History Month uh, celebration. I want to remind you there was refreshments outside. Also, if you get the chance before you leave, go up to the third floor. We have another uh, part of our celebration of Black History Month, which is an art exhibit by John Robinson. Uh, that's very moving art. It's about his journey with cancer and the things that inspired him in his life.
Uh, so I invite you to go upstairs to the third floor. It's in the, it's in the gallery that's between the old uh, library and the new edition. So please do take a look at it. Um, it's a great honor and privilege that I stand before you today to introduce a remarkable individual whose life's work, y'all come on in, um, that has left an indelible mark on our community. Uh, Dr. Willie Housel embodies the essence of dedication, service, and leadership. Um, as we gather here as a part of BSU's Black History Month, it is fitting that we shine a spotlight on who I consider to be a local hero whose contributions have shaped the landscape of civil rights, education, and historic preservation in Valdosta. Uh, born and raised in Valdosta, Dr. Housel's journey is one of unwavering commitment to positive change. Um, after graduating from Pineville High School, which is, was the black high school here in Valdosta before desegregation, um, Dr. Housel embarked on a remarkable educational journey. Um, I'm very proud that he's a part of the BSG family, along with earning a Master of Education, an Education Specialist degree from Valdosta State. He has earned degrees from St. Leo College, Pepperdine University, and uh, Nova Southeastern University, where he got his doctorate. Uh, he spent 27 years in public education, including as a teacher of Lowndes County, administrator and principal for Brooks County School, from where he retired in 2002. He was also a student teacher supervisor here at BSU, as well as professor and director at Park University at Moody Air Force Base. Um, Dr. Howes was a man of great energy. Um, while he was uh, serving all this uh, different roles in public education, he was also, st also striving to bring positive change to the political landscape of the Valdosta community. In the early 1980s, he led the efforts to change the unequal representation of the black community in local public uh, posts due to the voting system of at-large voting. Uh, the results of this at-large system led to an all-white city council with no black representation or representation based on the areas of the city. Uh, ultimately, this effort was successful, and as a result of that, Dr. Housel was elected to represent District 1 on the city council in February of 1985, where he continued to affect change within the city through um, um, helping change uh, hiring practices and parks and recreation policy. Uh, Dr. Housel has also been very involved in efforts to recognize and preserve Southside Valdosta history, including Pineville High School. Dr. Housel is an important contributor to the VSU Archives Community Digitization um, Access and Preservation Partnership. Uh, his primary source materials he's contributed to us um, that we've put online are invaluable in documenting and contextualizing this community's history. Um, Housel has said he's most proud of every opportunity he has had to mentor children, teens, and young adults. He enjoys healthy community youth, develop the skills needed to unlock their full potential, and embrace life with confidence and resilience. His two books, The Power of Self-Esteem, Using It All to Get It All, and The Power of Positive Self-Esteem, Developing, Implementing, and Sustaining, were inspired by his commitment to helping others live their best life. Uh, through his service on the Valdosta City Council, his distinguished career in education, and his passionate endeavors in preserving our rich history, Dr. Housel has exemplified the values of integrity, compassion, and resilience. His impact extends far beyond the boundaries of our city, inspiring generations to come, and, in, and leaving an enduring, leg, enduring legacy of empowerment and progress. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming your true inspiration, Dr. Willie Housel. I want to get like Urkel, did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It is an honor for me to be here today for the VSU Black History Program. It is my hope that this message will inspire you to challenge unfair and injustice wherever they may exist. First, I would like to thank a few people whom I've had the pleasure of working with for several months and who are responsible for this important event. Professor Deborah Davis has been an intricate part of this collecting, securing, and archiving our most precious possessions, the history and legacy of the Southside community and the Pineville High School experience. 
Thank you, Miss Isabel Keimer, aka Izzy, for working tirelessly uh, on scanning and cataloging, catalog cataloging, and uploading our historical data. The university's VTEC program. Thank you, Mr. Dallas Suttle. Your technical skills are greatly appreciated. And thank you, Mr. Douglas Carson, who just stole my script. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you, sir. He's the program coordinator of archives and special collections. He, we thank you for your present, your future support. Finally, thank you to our audience for your attendance here today. And my very, very special guests, my church family, my brothers and sisters in Christ throughout this community, Mr. Harry, Ms. Herman, all of those who are part of the Pineville Alumni Organization. All of you are, are honored guests, and thank you for being here. My aim is to share firsthand knowledge without, of becoming a change agent in my community, lending itself to the theme, want change, be the change. It is my belief that this message can resonate with all generations, beginning with the greatest generation ever lived, to the baby boomers, the X and the Y's and the Z's, and now the Alpha generation. To all the distinguished historians here today, please forgive me if it sounds like I'm preaching to the choir. It is not my intentions to bring a history lesson this afternoon. I simply want to show how an extraordinary era in black history affected the lives of black citizens here, even in our community. Therefore, for the next few moments, and I mean few, please allow me to take you on a journey into the past, back to a time when things were quite different for black citizens in this country and yes, even in Val Dawson. Up until the 1960s and the 70s and beyond, blacks continued to live under the segregated laws that caused undue hardship. I speak of a time when the laws of the land, the separate but equal doctrine, derived from the racist decision by the U.S. Supreme Court Plessy versus Ferguson case in 1896. As the facts present the case, Mr. Homer Plessy, seven eighth white and one eighth black. I got to pause there for a minute. Hmm, okay. I think I got it. He purchased a train ticket to travel within the Louisiana and took a seat in a car reserved for white passengers only. He refused to move to the colored or Negro rail car and was arrested and charged with the violation of the Louisiana Separate Car Act. This separate but equal case argued the separate race this separate but equal case argued that separate rail cars for whites and African Americans were equal at least as required by the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. The 14th Amendment adopted in 1868 granted citizens and legal rights to African Americans and enslaved people who had been emancipated after the American Civil War. However, the outcome of the case would extend far beyond rail cars and into the very fabric 
of our society, especially in Southern states. Judge John H. Ferguson presided over the case. He dismissed Mr. Per Plessy's case, ruling that Louisiana had the right to regulate railroad companies while they operated within state boundaries. The outcome of this case encouraged legislators to pass laws that oppress African Americans by means of segregation. These laws were also known as Jim Crow laws, which enforced racial segregation in the South between the end of the Reconstruction of 1877 and the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s. These laws would be enforced by criminal penalties. These laws created separate but equal schools, parks, waiting rooms, and other, and other segregated public facilities, especially in the South. This concept of separate but equal was doomed from the very start because equality was never achieved and could never be achieved, only the separate part. Most people have no knowledge of the meaning behind the term Jim Crow other than the association with the Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow originated from a popular song and dance act supposedly modeled after a slave. The act was called Jump Jim Crow It was performed by a white actor, Thomas D. Rice. We called him Daddy Rice in blackface in 1828. It was performed by a white actor, Thomas D. Rice, and his performance, as a result, became a derogatory epithet for meaning Negro. The source, wikipedia.org, on the Jim Crow laws. Fast forward now to the year 1982. I realized back to, I relocated back to Valdosta after serving in the United States Air Force. Shortly after returning, I realized that black citizens did not have a seat at the table where decisions were being made. We were taxed but we were not represented. Our city leaders gave no consideration to the needs and concerns of the people who lived on the south side of town. I asked the question, how can I make a change in my community? Or what can I do? Then my thought was, if I wanted things to change, I need to be a part of the change. And my, my motto is, if you want things to change, be the change. It all started with the Ulmer Avenue Fire Station back in 1982, and the word was out. The city officials had planned to close the only fire station on the south side of town, where predominantly black neighborhoods were located. We were told the closing of the fire station was due to budget restraints. The South Side residents expressed the need to keep the fire station open. The train would delay the north and the southbound traffic by up to 30 minutes at a time, and most of those minutes were critical. There were major concerns about emergency vehicles arriving at our houses in timely manners. We needed a fire station nearby. Our request was ignored, and the city leaders continued to support an unpopular proposal to cut services within the city. And they included Alma Avenue Fire Station. The decision to close the station was, a, was very unpopular it prompted citizens to act. 
individuals from the NAACP, Winnersville Coalition Consultants, and other organizations joined forces. We attended city council meetings, asked questions, and voiced our concerns. We all became change agents. By attending these council meetings, we realized that the entire political system of voting needed to be changed from at large to district. In the at large system, a candidate would need the majority of the votes throughout the entire city to win an election. Now keep in mind that whites outnumber black voters four to one during that time. The district voting would assure the selection of a candidate from his or her own neighborhood. Mr. Todd Johnson, an attorney for the South Georgia Legal Services and the United States Justice Department, initiated a civil action lawsuit on our behalf. And the rest is history. A new district voting system replaced the at-large voting system. This method was a fair and equitable method of selecting candidates. The proof lies in the statistics. For example, before 1982, there were only two persons elected to public office in the city of Valdosta and Lowes County throughout its entire history and they were Miss Ruth Council and Mr. Clayton Barry. Now, since implementing the district voting in 1984, there have been 37 blacks selected to city council, county commission, and the Valdosta and Lowndes County Boards of Education collectively since that time, including myself. Indeed, a significant historical change took place during this time in the voting process in our city and county. The Valdosta Daily Times newspaper article dated February 24th, 2013, 11 years ago this month, provided the reader with details of the events led by concerned citizens who want to make change in our community. And by the way, my wife, Sister Pat, has been with me since the very beginning. At the end of the article, thank you so much for Sister Pat. <laughs> At the end of the article, the interview question was asked, would change have come without the lawsuit? We all responded in one voice and with one word, no. The pattern of separate but equal doctrine was integrated into various facets of our society, including the public school system. For it was the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954 that overturned the Plessy versus Ferguson's case. So it seemed. 65 years later, these laws continue to be a part of our public education system until 1965. The federal government intervened once again with litigation against these segregated laws. I grew up on a separate but unequal school system and graduated from Pineville High School in 1969. I have a short clip of the Pineville High School documentary where alumni members shared memories of their educational experience. We were fortunate to have our former principal of, of Pineville High School, Mr. C.C. Hall, take part in this documentary. Mr. Hall is 98 years old and still goes to work part-time in his place of business. He says, someone has to answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> A big thank you to Dr. Mark George, 
who has created a digital footprint of this Pineville story that will last for generations to come. This is an excerpt of the Pineville High School story. Gotcha. It's like our parents raised us to live in a two system society. Okay, we, we realized that there were certain things we couldn't do, and there were certain things we could do. Certain places you didn't go, and certain things that you didn't do uh, because you knew what the consequences would be. Mama and Daddy did their best, their level best to shield us from as much of that as they could. This school was the heartbeat of this community. That was and, uh, and my teachers know my parents. They knew my grandfather, they knew my mother, and my father. Uh, and they uh, was out of line. Uh, my mother would know about it before I got home after school. <laughs> We knew every teacher. And they were like family. They were our parents. So we were not going to need something that they had. They were sacrificed to get it for us. We would. We were going to show them the other thing when they were proud. The government didn't pay. Mr. Owen did everything. I can tell you, he worked hard. So, uh, between the two schools, Pine Hill and Southeast to make things work for the students and the parents. When they saw something out of the ordinary, they set aside and talked to us like we were there too. We were going to represent them when we got out, when we went to college, when we went to the uh, military, when we went to, to, uh, uh, into the workforce, wherever we went. So they wanted us to be more prepared than they were. They it was caring and compassion from the teachers, and you know, they treated all the students that way. There was no option for us to fail. When you walk behind the you were the top of the land, the best of the best. That's how I got to understand what it takes to fill it. It's all a man. And it really does take a village. Talk about it takes a village. Well, this was the village. It was almost like school didn't even turn out because we had crises and what have you. And everybody, if they did participate, they still came back to the campus. All the good times we had there. He had Jim, you know, you can't come back. <laughs> we used to have phone fires. So up until about 7, 8 o'clock at night, we were still here at this school doing something. The challenge was great for people to get here on time, even in the rain, because they had to walk. Walk two and a half miles every day. It was about three miles one way for me. And this is walking from uh, the, the uh, west side of Valdosta to the south side of Valdosta. Nobody's starting there. That's the all the same right there. And the front of them. Oh, first of all, I hit that bus, you know, but we had to walk. There was no equality, you know, separate but equal. No, there. <laughs> It was supposed to be separate for people, but it wasn't. Separation part existed, but the equal part never existed. Everybody was prepared there to have the same thing that God was and all we wanted. Uh, we knew that um, the blacks got the best of everything, and we had to take whatever we could get. When it would rain, we had to uh, walk in mud, water, to get into the school. Uh, and at Valdosta High, they didn't have that problem. Uh, uh, their parking lot was paid. We would, uh, again, second hand books. 
And we realized that by looking at some of the texts and what they were copyrighted. They used to send over old equipment, old books. They'd load them up on the back of the truck, and then they would bring them over. And then they'd push them off on the ground, and we would take them and tape them together. You know, and that material, we didn't realize it at the time, but that material was obsolete by the time we got it. We had to teach it. We just didn't have the equipment the teachers needed to teach us. Because that's all they needed was the equipment. They give us the equipment, then we could finish. Yes, it was getting new books that, uh, and passing us the old books and the new uniforms for the football team. And, we had to suffer with what we had. No pads. Uh, we had all the secondary stuff. Uh, I remember when we went to uh, camp, they went to camp down in Lake Park, which was a facility. Our camp was right in this gym. And we got our baby from Moody for the athletes. For instance, helmets, you know, we played with that pine bill. We played with the same helmets throughout our lives through the days. I fell off so we get new equipment in every year. We had the transportation, the high school football team, had the buses and things to take them where they need to go. But we had the high school football team and the riding team go to the We were the old used county bus. Stadium, uh, the condition pale compared to Cleveland, Cleveland got lots of high, you know. The players, and gone to high and go back and look at old film. We can't do that because we didn't have the funds for that. What they failed to understand is that we didn't have a problem with being separate. Our problem with came with not being equal. We had been told um, our junior year at Pine Bear High that uh, that would be our last year there. About a month before it was due uh, for school to start, we learned that the system was the school system was going to be integrated. We were forced to close the doors because we were one of those states or uh, cities that just refused to integrate. Pursuant to a federal court order, we would uh, join forces with students at Valhassa High School. They had to integrate whether they wanted to or not. They kind of held out for a very long time. Would we rather have separate but equal or integration? That came up. It's a mixed feeling. From viewing this excerpt, the full length will be uploaded in the next couple of weeks on our YouTube channel, and you can see the rest of the story. These testimonies you've heard on the video confirmed our concerns about how segregation in schools made it difficult for black children to learn. <clears throat> We had to learn from outdated textbooks. We used football uniforms and band uniforms and played secondhand band instruments. But we sounded like angels. <laughs> <laughs> Although we had a team, we had to learn in the deficit. We had many success stories as well. In fact, two Pineville High School graduates became change agents wherein they integrated Valdosta State College in 1963. They were Drew Nell Thomas and Robert Pierce. The legacies of Pineville High School graduates are too far to, to mention. 
too numerous to mention. And in closing, I would like to leave you with three key ingredients to consider when becoming a change agent. <clears throat> Number one, listen to the concerns of others. Hear what they have to say. Number two, be pers have a persuasive voice. Be willing to speak up and speak out, letting your voices be heard in a tactful, in a diplomatic way. And be an advocate for what is right and good for all mankind. This means to develop a passion for something greater than yourselves. With this, I say to you, thank you for taking this journey with me today. And remember, if you want to see change, what should we do? Be part of the change. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending. I would be remiss and not if I didn't thank uh, Dr. Housel's family, including Pat and his community family that came out to see us. Thank you for VSU students and faculty who are here. Um, once again, there's more refreshments outside and uh, please stop by the third floor and look over John Robinson's art exhibit. Uh, it's, I think it'll move you and I think you'll be glad you did. Thank you for coming. Opportunity to travel outside of Valdosta, if to meet any of the black leaders, professionals, or did, did, did you ever reach that pinnacle to reach some of the civil rights leaders and anything like that? Because as I listened to you and I read your books, you read a, 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 a high plateau, but it seems like sometimes we don't get to know these things here about us. Yeah, we're going back into the days, we were active in an era. Now, only so much can take place within that era. In that era, we were able to reach a pinnacle of getting national acclaim 
by uh, a, an article produced in Jet Magazine going back in 1985, where in the history it was recorded in the article in the Jet Magazine. Also, this is the last question. Uh, back in the 60s, in my time, we found the same era. Uh, did you ever meet Martin Luther King or Jesse Jackson or uh, Alan Clayton Powell or any of those? I met some of the guys who came down from Atlanta and uh, Jose Williams, um, Jesse Jackson. To be honest with you, those are the only two individuals that came to South Dusty that I had to host. But other than that, I was not aware of them. They came to the city because you had too many different factions of people uh, becoming uh, historians, so to speak, or, or community actors. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, can you put one plug out for Dr. Mark George? for all the work that you've done. You state that once again. Well, like I said before, Dr. Rod is, is a godsend individual who was at the right place at the right time to tell our story, to help us tell our story, to put it in a digital, digital platform, which also places it out in, in the cloud for generations to come. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Peace be unto you. Congratulations, brother. Great accomplishment. I didn't know to take my hat off. Did I do that? I like this. I like this. How you doing, man? What's up, man? Going to school, folks. How you enjoy the program? Good, man. Hey, I'm a history buff. Where am I? We lived there. You know, I was in South Carolina, but it was the same thing. Same thing. It was the same thing. Separate, but unequal. <laughs> taxation without representation. So it was just a thing that was across, and a lot of that hit home. You know, secondhand textbooks, secondhand instruments, but the music was beautiful. And so we lived that very thing, just 400 miles to the left. And it was still out the side. Okay, what's your name again? Eric Curator. Thank you so much, my brother. Oh, Minister. Oh, yeah, Minister. Okay, all right. I'll see you at church in. Romans 8 and 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. To God be the glory.
Now there's evidence, no estimation. With truth, we can truly be free. Under the Almighty, we'll be one nation. Nothing to stop the mobility. So you see, we made up our minds. The choice is clear. Now it may come as a surprise. After all the struggles through the years, there's still determination in our lives. Determination. In the children, we can see hope for the future society. In their desire to try and learn, there's a fire that should ever burn. So you see, we made up our minds, the choice is clear. Now it may come as a surprise. Struggles through the years, there's still determination in our lives. Determination, 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 determination. Ever since the beginning of time, man has struggled with his mind, trying to bring about order, peace, and tranquility. And the law of seeing this, he sent messages and prophets to man, so that he may receive the blueprint for human growth and development. Now these prophets had to struggle and strive to carry on the revelation of the Almighty.